Jensen, welcome to The Monthly Book. Thank you. And congratulations on this, your first book, Acute Misfortune, The Life and Death of Adam Cullen. And um, you first met your subject, Adam Cullen, when you did a profile of him. Mm. Whose idea was it to do the first profile you did for the Sydney Morning Herald? Was that something you came up with? Or uh, was I was it just one of those journalistic uh, tasks that gets assigned to you. I was on staff at the um, Sydney Morning Herald at that time, so it was, I think, probably an assigned profile. I, not even, not even certain. I can't recall whether it was or wasn't, but um, it was for. I remember it was for the Saturday edition of the Sydney Morning Herald, and they had a profile page which was only reasonably briefly lived where um, people's hidden obsessions were meant to be profiled. So in this instance, I was writing about Adam Cullen in the context of his obsession with tanning and preserving animal hide. So how much did you know about him before you set off to do um, this? I certainly, I, I knew his pictures, although not hugely well, um, and I knew his reputation. He was one of these artists who was written about frequently and who, even if he wasn't being profiled, you'd see his quotes turning up in pieces about something else. He, um, he, he was someone who I think was always offering a, you know, a good pithy two line quote for a newspaper audience. Um, and so I, you know, I was certainly aware of him, um, but I didn't know terribly much about him. What did you think of his work? Uh, there were pictures of his that I'd seen that I thought were were truly wonderful. There were also pictures that were were less good, and I think his um, his output became um, more and more uneven as as his health declined and as his as his life became more chaotic. Um, but certainly, you know, I like everyone knew the Archibald portrait of David Wenham, um, and I knew some of the um, text works that he was making in the late nineties, um, and. Just around this time, he had a retrospective at the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which I'd seen. So I'd, you know, I'd, I'd seen a sort of a, a reasonable sweep of his work. So when you turned up for this profile mm. um, on preserving dead things, um, what was the uh, chemistry between you? Did you did you feel that you were intrigued by this character? Yeah, he, I mean, it was it was a wild day in the company of this person who was pulling fox heads out of eskies and you know tanning baths, sloshing around with weighted down um, kangaroo skins and, and so on. And um, I found him to be truly interesting. And I asked, I, I think one of the things that interested me about him, and this in reflection or on reflection was a, um, was a technique of his, you would ask him a question and he'd say, I need to think about that and then get back to it later on because he was polishing a quote. Um, but it, you know, as a as a young journalist, it made me feel like I was writing insightful, well, asking insightful <laughs> questions. I don't know that I necessarily was, um, but I was impressed by the degree to which he wanted, in amongst all this chaos that was that day, to be very precise about what he was saying. Was it a performance? It, it, absolutely, um, and it was. I think the first six months of working on the book, I was watching a performance. Um, and it was only as he started to test me and we negotiated, I suppose, the degree to which we were going to trust each other, um, that that performance fell away and I think at times I saw behind it. Um, but the performance would crop up again, you know, sort of three years in you could still turn up for an interview and, and get the Adam Cullen show and you really had to work to, to sort of unpick the you know the the many sort of personalities that he'd stitched together for himself. So he, um, after being very happy with what he'd read that you'd mm. written in the City Morning Herald, um, called you to propose this idea of, of you writing his his biography or, or a book about him. Yeah, uh, he. I only discovered later on that he'd invented this publishing contract. Um, but when he called, he said Thames and Hudson had asked for for this book um, and that he was ill and ready to talk and he, you know, he wanted me to write it, which as a 19 year old journalist is all very flattering. Um, and I quite quickly found myself staying on and off in his spare room and, and working on this book. Um, and it was only much later in the piece that I realized all of this had been a confection of, its, of itself. Um, this, had, this had been a, a means by which to try and get me to spend Lots More of time, time with him. him. Yeah. So, um, when you 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 got that call, I guess you were flattered. Mm. Um, 
And then, you know, as a 19-year-old journalist, the, the idea that this was a big, a big job and this was a way to write a book, mm. um, the, the, it all sort of uh, fell into place for you in that sense. Did you think this was going to be a really good way to spend a couple of years? Yeah, I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so, you know, I think... A lot of it was done without precision, just talking to someone and taking shorthand. And um, thankfully, Adam was interesting enough a subject that just talking to him, I think, produced a reasonable account of his life. But it was, it, it was you know, I hadn't really a clear idea of what I wanted to do. I, I thought I was going to write a big scholarly biography. In fact, when Adam first called me, I had lunch with David Marr to ask him, you know, how he wrote Patrick White the Life and, you know, had, how should I organize my and what files? Did and David Marr tell you? He immediately said, this is a terrible idea, you shouldn't do it. Uh, but, because? You know, <laughs> because that's David's advice on, on all things. <laughs> um, but he then, you know, he then gave me some sound advice, uh, given that which I was, was going what? to do it, which, which was, you know, write everything down, keep fastidious notes, keep dates on everything, put everything in, in order. You know, um, the, the great, I think, power of, of um, that Patrick White book is that it runs in a, um, in a very careful linear fashion. I ended up writing a book that is completely non-linear and um, I think someone described it the other day as, as scattergun. I don't think it's quite that. I think that they're very deliberate juxtapositions. Um, but the book I wrote was not the one I thought I was going to write. Um, I was hoping I would appear nowhere in the book. It was going to be this detached, sober um, piece of long-form journalism. Uh, well, sober, that's a funny word to yeah. use. Well, uh, but, uh, and we'll come to that in a moment. But <laughs> why did it have to involve moving in with him? That was obviously something that Adam was very keen to see happen. Um, and I, I didn't live there. I, st I stayed there for, you know, couple of weeks at a time and stretches and every other weekend and so on. But a, a big, big part of that was that he lived um, quite away from where I lived in, you know, he was in the Blue Mountains and I was living in uh, Marrickville or Paddington at the time. Um, and so, you know, it just made sense. If I was going out there for interviews, I might as well stay. What did your parents and friends think about this project? Uh, they have now read the book and I think are glad to um, not have not have known just how... Uh, sort of unpredictable it had been in places. Um, I think they assumed I was, you know, off off doing what a journalist might be doing, you know, sitting down and, and, and taking conventional interviews with someone, but, but the interviews became less and less conventional. You describe it as a Sisyphean task, mm. um, trying to understand other people, uh, and you say you were dealt a boulder called Adam. Mm. Um, did it feel like a boulder to you, one, one that was so, threatening sometimes. to th crush you? Yeah, I, I mean, I found, as the interviews went on, I found the relationship with Adam more and more exhausting. Because? Um, because he demanded so much. Um, he would be calling me at all hours. He, he wanted this great kind of closeness that I wasn't necessarily keen to give. I certainly, you know, I, I was working full time as a journalist. I, I didn't have the time to be an accessory in Adam's life, which is what he what he wanted. Um, but also, I, I, you know, the the physical provocations, um, like shooting me uh, or, or throwing me off a motorcycle, they, they sort of they were draining things. Um, and I I found I, you know I, I don't above think above and ever... beyond the call of duty, I would suggest in any <laughs> biographer. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I was ever scared of Adam, but I um, I was frustrated by him, I, and and not just because of those provocations. I I was frustrated at times by um, by his self-destruction, by the fact that there was this horrible inevitability to um, the entire time that I knew him. And twice he called me in the time that I was writing the book to say you know, that he was about to die, that he had pancreatic cancer, for instance. And that when he told me that, I was amazed by how upset it, it made me. And you know, it turned out not to be the case at all. And then um, you know, later on when he slid into his comas and, and got close towards the end to eventually dying, I, you know, I, I found myself again hugely emotionally drained by, uh, by a situation I'd become um, quite, I, I don't think improperly entwined with, but, but quite entwined all, all the same. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think I wasn't alone in that either. Adam ran out many friendships on, you know, by virtue of the fact that he demanded too much from them. 
How much do you think his performance was, um, you know, his idea of what an artist should be, um, the, the kind of artist that comes out of, you know, in living intensely on the edge, um, in the depths, um, uh, this idea, this sort of mythic idea, it seems to have informed everything he did. Yeah, and I think that's twofold. Um, the first is the performance was what he thought other people wanted from an artist. Um, and he was right about that. You know, the reason he turned up in the pages of newspapers and was frequently quoted and so on was because he, he played all the tropes of, of dangerous talent. Like to what? A Drunk, drugs, yeah, you know, extreme, the, it, it, ex bad behaviour. Bad behaviour. You know, um, I think his, his weapons trial um, in tabloid newspapers looked like a dream, surely. You know, you have this... Well, tell people what the weapons trial You know, was. you had this... Um, artist who had, who was well known, who had won the Archibald Prize, who was caught drunk in his car um, with something like 28 firearms, some of them registered, some of them not. Um, and there was, there was no kind of elaborate criminality of this. It was like a, it was like what would happen if a, if a 10 year old boy could drive a car and fill it with all the guns he wanted. You know, there's, um, it wasn't, it wasn't like he was planning to do anything hugely mischievous. He was just, you know, the, the foolishness of the enterprise, I think, allowed people to go, you know, this, this guy is what we want from an artist. He's, he's not all bad, but he's a little dangerous. Um, he, he does things that the rest of us couldn't. I mean, it, um, you know, there's, there is this idea, I think, uh, in Australia about painters, that we want our painters to be um, dangerous innocents, you know, um, people who can see the world in ways we can't because they live a way we don't live, but somehow they're going to offer us larger truths about ourselves. And I think sometimes Adam did do that with his work. And I, and I think that's the second part of this character we're talking about. While on some levels he played a role that people wanted from him, he also lived a marginal circumstance because it was, I think at least to some degree, necessary for his work. Um, Adam situated himself um, and and his good pictures were situated uh, on, on the edge of of this adult malevolence and this childhood innocence um, and, and some of the sublime um, early sculptural work he made and certainly some of the better paintings he made were, were there but but to live on that precipice is to live a, um, a not properly constructed life uh, Adam was always holding on to bits of childhood and yet um, I suppose practicing in the adult world, um, and, and I think that he, you know, the the drugs and and the the outrageous provocations weren't necessary, but they but they happened to be crutches around trying to hold on to this particular part of himself, which is a part of of life that you, you know you and I ran out of at the age of ten. Well, then let's talk about his parents because mm -hmm. um, the, the way this book is organised is. Um, uh, into chapters, um, f um, snapshots, I guess, of these these topics. You know, his his art, his drugs, the Archibald Prize, but his mother and his father. Um, so it's where we go, isn't it, to say why is this person behaving like this? What yeah. is it that about their childhood that might tell us something? So, so what was your um, approach there? I was very keen not to find myself a pop psychologist in this book. Um, and so Adam directed the conversations to his mother and to his father. Um, I, I wasn't looking to, to dig there necessarily to, to understand who he was, um, but he, I mean, he spoke constantly about his mother um, and his, his difficulties loving her, um, I think, were a defining aspect of his life. They spoke to what I eventually discovered to be his hidden sexuality, um, but they also informed a lot of the resentment he had around the world uh, or about the world. Um, you know, I think one of the most difficult lines to write in the book was, was something he told me early on, which was, I was 14 when I stopped loving my mother, um, which is such a concise and damning account of a life that will follow, I think. Um, and happily, I had time to meet his, his mother. His mother died while I was working on the book, but I at least got to, to know her in the course of writing it and, and certainly to know Adam's father, Kevin. And I think as figures, um, you know, why, while I don't stray into pop psychology in the book, and I certainly, unless something is told to me, I don't, I don't try and synthesise or, or look for meaning that isn't, that isn't there. But, but they are 
both figures that help explain Adam's life. There is there is the creative mother who he, um, as I say, struggled to love, although um, ultimately after she died realised that he did love her. Um, and, and then his, his father, this kind of larger than life Australian larrikin who, um, who was all of the things Adam wished he could be and wished would come easily to as him. As a man. As a man. Um, but but as, a, as a man who was effortlessly funny and um, comfortable and capable of, of the kind of storytelling that is burnished by building sites and, and you know. And, and sexually attractive. Yeah, and, and exactly, a, a, an imp. I mean, um, there, there were impishness, oh, there, there was impishness to, to Adam's character, um, but nothing like the kind of glinting charm that his, uh, that his father had. So, uh, but, but also, I mean, you say that he lost, he stopped loving his mother at 14, but you, you don't seem to have found a kind of um, miserable childhood there. No, I, I mean, this is the other aspect of Adam's desire to hold on to childhood was to try and find a complexity that, that wasn't there. He, he had a very happy childhood um, and he spent his life wishing it might be otherwise. Uh, and that's why he sought out complicating factors. I mean, Adam was ultimately deemed by a court to be badly mentally ill, but, um, but he sought out things like heroin. It was very deliberate to go and start taking drugs because it added some complexity to his life. He didn't want simply to be the blissful grommet from the northern beaches who happened to be a fine draftsman and went on to be a painter. You know, he wanted more than that. He wanted a bigger story than mm -hmm. that. Um, just, I know you said you didn't want to be an amateur psychologist or psychiatrist, but this mental illness, do you think there was any, you know, do you think he was mentally ill and this made him reach for all this kind of life or do you think the life made him mentally ill? The weapons trial we mentioned earlier, the, he pleaded to what would once have been termed insanity in that, in that trial. Um, he, he received from the court dispensation to be dealt with under the Mental Health Act and, and in the course of that had to submit to a psychiatric assessment. Um, and I, I read that assessment only after he died, but the, the court case itself was, I think, more than anything, what killed Adam. Um, he just stopped living because he suddenly had to confront the reality of everything and realise that there was a lot about his life that wasn't unique and, and wonderful and, and unquantifiable. He was an alcoholic who suffered bipolar. Um, and the court decided that for him, and he was standing in front of that magistrate, forced to face this very plain, very simple reality. And the, the psychiatric report, you know, in, in its six pages, it does all of what I was trying to do for four years. Um, it's a, it was a quite a sobering um, document to read. Um, but I do think, and I spoke to Adam about this, you know, that that standing there, this last embarrassment, and the embarrassment was not what he had done. The embarrassment was simply that he was ordinary. It, it was to me like that scene at the end of The Wizard of Oz and you know the, yes. the curtain parts and there's the big voices from the little man. A little man on a chair. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the epigraphs of this book is this reproduction um, of the line, endurance is more important than truth um, with, in Adam's mm. handwriting and that's his his signature, and you say he used to write it on all of his Almost books. Almost everything. Um, it was, you know, it, it, it was in the front of all his books. Any time he would give someone a present, he'd probably write it. Um, it, it ended up um, misspelled as it happened uh, onto some memorial cards that were printed after he died. Um, and the line was never his. It's, it's Bukowski's. It's, it's from Barfly. Um, and, it's, and the whole line is, anybody can be a non-drinker. It takes a special talent to be a drunk. It takes endurance. And then endurance is more important yeah. than truth. But what does it even mean? Uh, to, to Adam's mind, it, it, was, it was an excuse for everything. He, he was He just had to maker, live through everything. Yes, he was a maker of myths. And... Um, he was not necessarily a seeker of truth. I mean, many artists position themselves as these tellers and seekers of truth. Adam was something else. Adam was um, was a he was a performer in some ways. He was he was playing a role and and doing difficult things and enduring. And that endurance was the important thing. I think it it was a line that for Adam allowed all of the half truths and outright lies to be 
um, press ganged into service for his larger purpose, which was simply to endure. He he really wanted to leave something behind. I mean, this is this is why he asked me to write. The, well, one of the reasons he asked me to write the book was that he had a number of things he wanted to say. He wanted to be certain those things would be written down and they would survive him. Um, you know, he, he used to talk about leaving behind aesthetic residue. Um, we talked once early on. Uh, it's not Sounds book, like grit. Yeah. Well, we we, we talked early on about um, Captain Beefheart and how he was. Um, he fetishized Beefheart because Beefheart was able to dip in and out of existence. That that you know there was there was enough assembled around him that he needed not be there as the character anymore. Um, and I think that you know to some degree that's what Adam was doing. He was building this carapace of, of images and stories and and ultimately of of his his own thoughts about his life that mm-hmm. would would all be there and he could come out of the middle and and left would be the shell of what was his life and that would be enough to. To remember him by. Like a kind of insect mm. who, who grows out of his, his own skin. But you say so much of Adam was paraphrased, yeah. like this line, you know, um, endurance is more important than truth, which I, I want to come back to it because it's, you know, it's a whole lot of drunks sitting around saying, you know, you've got to, anybody can be a non drinker. Yeah. It takes something special to be a drunk, which is kind of a whole lot of alcoholics talking to each other about being an alcoholic. So why is when, that kind when, of when meaningful Adam's, to anybody? When Adam saw Barfly, um, it was his first encounter with Bukowski. And it was a film that spoke to everything as an adolescent, he thought might be his life. It, it, um, it looked for the beauty in squalor. It celebrated drinking. Um, it said that art could not be made politely, that it, you know, that it must be made difficultly. Um, the, the Mickey Rock character in the film is, is this character, I think, that Adam would have very happily have been. Um, and he borrowed the line. I don't, th- I don't think Adam ever formed a firm view of what that line meant. Um, as I, as I, you know, as I went through my notepad to, oh, notepads that created them to put this book together, I kept finding lines of Adams that were borrowed, um, and and a lot of his work, particularly, he was making these text paintings in the um, early and mid '90s, which I think are, are some of his best paintings, and they're they're it is language harvested from popular culture. He would sit in front of television. He had a he had a musical ear for language. He would pick up a phrase and say it aloud over and over until it would shed or gain meaning or something would happen to it and it would become for him um, another Cohen to put onto a canvas. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I, uh, it was remarkable as I would be transcribing, sort of going, oh, um, you know, the even one of the first lines he said to me, um, I know I'll be dead because I'm so busy dying, is, is slightly paraphrased Dylan. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Jim Morrison was constantly being paraphrased um, even in his diaries as his mother died and he wrote, you know, I actually think this is a, a lovely detail in this particular diary. It's, it's, it's the diary he wrote the year his mother died and he writes on one page, my mother died today and then the next is my mother died yesterday. It's a, you know, it's a Camus line um, that, that actually it wasn't done glib. It, it was that, you know, that, that it's, a, it's a very moving diary um, that particular year but um, he couldn't help but go for the go for the reference, and and yet he he felt and meant what he was writing as he used that that language. Did he um, did he act as if these were lines that he had thought of, or did he just um, use them unattributed because he thought everybody understood the reference? For for Adam, there was never attribution. He was a magpie. Um, he called it transcription. Um, but it, you know, it was often theft. Um, and, and I think, you know, even looking at the way he made paintings, um, he always referred to them as the final document. Everything else was just building up to and collecting so that the final document could be made. And um, I think that's, you know, it's, it's true also about how he collected language. It was anything he picked up could become, um, the, you know, the service of a final piece of work. And ultimately, I think he began to regard his character as his final work. Where did the Archibald Prize come into life on the edge? You mean for, for Adam sort of living? Yeah, put, put your painting into the Archibald Prize. It's... Validation. Um, you know, the, this Adam's character, I mean, one of the reasons I've written a book that is 
deliberately fragmented and based, uh, you know, if it has a technique anywhere in it, the technique I think is juxtaposition. Um, because Adam had various characters and he could, he could occupy them um, consecutively and sometimes concurrently. And even though he wanted to live on the fringe, um, and he wanted this outsider reputation. He also wanted to be told he was good. Mm. Um, and th somewhere in between that with the Archibald Prize was the joke of being able to say, I won the Archibald Prize. You know, he really wanted that validation. No young painters were entering the prize when he entered it, and certainly when he won it in 2000. Um, it was a surprising thing that a contemporary painter had won what had become a fairly stiff prize. Um, so what were but, the politics of that? Well, I mean, Adam liked to think, he claimed always that he received hate mail right up until his death for this, you know, this terrible, outrageous picture. Um, you know, that it was, it was a, popular, a popular decision um, to, for him to win that prize. Um, the, the media reporting at the time has, has people sort of, you know, pouring praise onto this picture. Um, the, the irony again for Adam, and it's, and it's I think he's, you know, there is constant duality in his character, but the irony is that everyone thought he'd painted David Dan from Sea Change. David Wenham. David Wenham, but he'd painted David Wenham from The Boys, this, uh, you know, this terrible sociopath. Murderous, yeah. Um, and they and couldn't tell the difference they, between no. David Dan and a, and a murderous sociopath. And that really hurt Adam. It was one of, it was one of the moments where he got what he wanted. He finally won this prize. I mean, he, as he, after being called to be told he'd won, he drove all the way to the art gallery, simply muttering over and over, "I've done it! I've finally done it!" Um, and yet, it was also the moment where society least understood him. Mm. He um, showed you his ravaged belly early on. Mm. It gave you the title of the book, "Acute Misfortune." Um, tell us for those who who haven't read the book yet, where that comes from. Yeah, in that first interview I did for the Sydney Morning Herald, we were sitting in his studio and he said, um, I'm going to die, which again was a you know, deliberate pr provocation. And then um, to sort of to, conf or to, to cement the provocation, he took his shirt off and he had, uh, I'd never seen a scar like this. It was sort of um, twisting all the way up his stomach and there, there were these great sort of um, burr holes where, because he was so sickly, the drainage ports that were in him in his pancreatitis operations never really properly healed and, and they just left these great craters in him and he was sort of pushing his thumbs into these holes and saying, you know, look at me, I'm going to die. Um, and so if he, he looked, I think I say in the book, like an overstuffed carpet bag. He really did because he had this alcoholic heroin bloat and, and then all this twisted sinew and, and scar tissue and so on. Um, and, and, you know, surprised as I was by, by this, I just asked what had happened, as, as you might. Um, and his answer was sufficiently enigmatic, I think, to, to interest me in writing the book. And I think the book really is about trying to answer or explain that first answer. And the first answer was acute misfortune. I think the art world caused this. Hmm. Um, and, I th you know, I... I that I, I, I recount that scene in the, in the first chapter of the book and I hope that I spend the rest of the book maybe adding some nuance to, to that first glib um, explanation. So the art world, but really he caused it, didn't he? But I don't know if you can take him from it or it from him. Let's talk about the way you, you wrote this book. Um, who are your models for this sort of up close and personal approach? You mentioned the, the work of Joseph Mitchell. Tell me about mm -hmm. him. Uh, I mean, Mitchell, I, I don't claim to write any, <laughs> anywhere near like uh, Mitchell wrote, but he was a writer at The New Yorker who produced, I think, some of the great um, profiles in American journalism, um, partly because he was such a beautiful prose stylist, but also because he let people speak. You know, you would read the language of an ordinary stevedore um, and you would be reading about them because it turns out that they hold some you know, record for eating clams or something. Um, but you saw bits of life you wouldn't ordinarily get to see and you wouldn't get that sort of access. Mitchell um, was a chronicler of the eccentrics of Manhattan, I think, um, and obviously an eccentric himself. I think he, he finished his career with 30 years of writer's block going to the New York New Yorker office every day and uh, sitting in his office and then going home and never once writing a word in those 30 years. Um, 
crippled as he was, I think, by his last subject, who uh, was meant to be writing a history of, um, it might have been of all time or so, it was some enormous history. Um, but Mitchell knew, I think, that, that in this briefcase that was meant to have the history was only torn up newspapers and his subject had been a fraud. Um, and, I, and I think that, that ruined him to some degree. I, I, I don't know enough about Mitchell to, to speculate on that. But, um, you know, I, I was interested in that kind of um, free access profile writing. Um, I felt, I mean, I, this book was written under the influence of, you know, a number of things and probably none of them are literature. Um, what are but, they? <laughs> this number a, of things. It's a fair bit of drinking. Um, yeah. I mean, you did kind of match but, him almost, mm, didn't you? I mean, I don't think I could drink like he did, but yeah, I drank a lot. Um, why, why did you drink a lot? I mean, did you sort of have a sense that, I mean, there was one point where, I'm, where I've said um, my notes, I've got this question here. Why did you sleep in a room with dried vomit in the rug next to your bed? You seem very fastidious here in the studio. But was that part of trying to live the life of the subject, trying to get it from the yeah, inside? Yeah, I, I mean, someone was showing me their life, um, a life that I found really interesting, repellent as it was at times and, um, and difficult as it was. Um, but I did feel the great privilege of access as well. And, and this was before our relationship metastasized into something um, that, you know, I don't, you know, something that Adam wanted it to be, but it wasn't going to be and so on. And, and um, you know, I, I, I was doing what I thought was, and I still think is, is journalism. I, at that time, I was interested in emergent journalism. I was, I would sleep on the streets with homeless children to, you know, to write essays, or I would you know, um, go and walk the Kokoda track to write on nationalism. I, I was interested in um, in journalism that required some endurance. <laughs> um, and with Adam, he pushed that much further than I would have liked it to have gone. Um, but I took also as my model uh, something he said about his own painting. And he said that he painted human car crashes. And while everyone wanted to see the car crash, no one wanted to go up close, but he did, and he, you know, he kept his eyes open. And he saw the blood, um, and I. Any time he tried to to make me blink, to to test my um, resolve, I, I just refused to recoil. Um, I probably wouldn't have the same resilience now as I did when I was nineteen, um, but I wanted to write this book that went up close and that didn't blink and that um, that couldn't be shocked. And I, I very early on decided that this would be a book without moral judgment um, and without the expression of shock or surprise. I wanted to write very evenly about what was very uneven. Um, and I think, you know, I, think I, I, I think the book is without moral judgment. What it does have is the occasional frustration because I, I found the situation frustrating and I thought for myself and also for the reader I needed occasionally to vent that frustration. But I, I never um, make an assessment as to whether or not Adam lived his life appropriately or otherwise. Well, yeah, this side about without judgment though. I mean, um, you, you, in the end you found him difficult to be around. Yeah. You moved cities but he rang you every day and you stopped answering his calls. Um, so in a sense, summing up what happened to him, I mean, you do judge that situation. How can you write a book about a man and what happened to him without a view? Um, I, I don't think I judge. I think I, I express... When you say their... moral judgment, I mean, mm. you know, you're not saying you know, this, he shouldn't have done this or this yeah. was bad behaviour, but there is a kind of judgment in, is this, you know, how, is this the way he necessarily had to live his life? Was he, you know, was his art that good? Was it worth that kind of sacrifice? Mm. Was it a kind of manufactured, a mythic kind of delusion mm. that he was living? I mean, I, I, I as a reader, I, I found that I was, I was judging him. And that, I think that's, that's what I'd hoped, that I would put down details. I, I really, I don't think I judge him. I think maybe there is some deliberate juxtapositions in the book that, that you know, wait certain scenes and so on. But in the drugs chapter, for instance, as as we're sort of travelling through drug deals and, you know, he's, we're shooting up in 
in a, his um, dealer's front room while the you know, toddler's crying in front of TV and so on. I record those scenes, I think, with detail, but I, I don't think I judge them. No, no, no. You, yeah. you, I am a camera. You are, <laughs> you are, you are observing mm. um, in a way that you know I certainly couldn't have done that job. So it takes takes a, a maybe it takes a time of your life. Or I think it does. I, I think um, my my great protection in this book was my naivety, um, and happily, I think um, I was less naive when I wrote it than when I was researching it. Um, and I think, I think I got to some truth about Adam. Um, one of the people who knows him very well read it recently and said that, um, you know, that he was there on each page, and that the words had, had caught him like a bird in a net. And um, I think that was a you know a great and kind thing to to have someone say about a biography. I you know I I didn't want to trap him as into you know to to capture him in a way he wanted not to be caught, but I. But I am happy that I think um, his his essence is somehow imbued in in how I told his story. Um, how did his father feel about the book? Um, I mean, I think it's not an easy book for my parents to read, let alone um, Adam's parents. I, I, anyone anyone whose child um, has has been so so important to them, um, and yet has lived a life that was as destructive as Adam's life is, um, uh, has with them, I think, a great a, a burden of legacy with, with, a, you know, with a child who died too soon, any parent who outlives their child. And um, I don't think Kevin, who's alive and Adam's father, I don't think he um, necessarily thinks that everything that is in the book should be in the book, but he um, very graciously sent me a, a note late on Father's Day to say that it was a hell of a read, um, which I think is, you know, is much more than I would have been able to muster necessarily. Do you believe in this, this myth of the, the artist, or this sort of the, that the artist must live on the edge like this? Or? No, not, at, not at all. I, I, but Adam was a very particular kind of artist. He, um, he was both... A, a, a painter playing the role of outsized painter, but he was also a, an artist celebrity in some way. He he was his character was as important to his work and overshadowed his work as times uh, as as was the work. So I, I think um, you know I, I I wouldn't suggest anyone needs to live the way that Adam lived, um, but he certainly felt that it was necessary. Well, it's a fine book, Eric. Um, thanks for writing it, and I look forward to your next. Thanks very much, Rona.